Hello everyone and welcome back to World's True Crime. I'm Brad and with me is my beautiful fiance Denise. Hello everyone. So this case we decided to go to Australia. Mm-hmm. This is a case I've heard about years ago but I've never actually heard a podcast about it. So I, I thought maybe we'd try it out. I'm sure that there's a podcast out there but... Oh there most likely is. I just never heard one personally and I thought I'd really like to uh, cover this case. For sure. So today we're talking about the case of Frank Vidovic. He is the perpetrator of the Queen Street Massacre in Melbourne, Australia. So, without further ado, Denise, you want to take off on this? Queen Street is one of the busiest streets in Melbourne, from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m., and is part of the Central Business District, or the CBD, not the oil. Okay. (laughs) The Queen Street Massacre was a mass shooting that happened at 191 Queen Street at one of the more high-powered offices in the Victorian headquarters of Australia Post and was also the headquarters for the Telecom Employees Credit Cooperative. It's the place where short-term money markets investments are made, where men and women staff tend to be highly qualified professionals and use computers the way most people use pens. Yeah, this time in 1987... There wasn't a lot of computers kicking around right now. Not too many people used them a lot. No. Most people are still on the old the old ways. Oh, I remember those computers. They were horrible. Yep. But back then, we thought they were so amazing. The Oregon Trail. Yeah. Frogger. Yeah. I used to play Frogger on one. So on December 8th, 1987, at 191 Queen Street, Melbourne, Victoria, Frank Vidovic managed to kill eight people and injuring five more in a matter of 17 minutes. Born September 7, 1965, Frank Vidovic was the son of Drago, a Croatian father, and Lilana, an Italian mother. Frank grew up in a Melbourne suburb of West Preston with his older sister by three years, Lily. At 22, Frank still lived at home at the time of the massacre. As a young child, he had even wet his pants, and the class kids didn't want to sit next to him since he smelled, so they bullied him, laughed about it, and talked about it, which embarrassed him. It wasn't long after that that Frank made an entry into his diary. It cataloged his sexual problems. Frank linked those to an incident when he was eight years old and was forced to undress in a school locker room and friends made fun of his uncircumcised penis. He said, After this, nudity was a dirty word for me. It's hard for a self-conscious guy like me to talk about girls with confidence. And since the age of 12, I knew that normal sex was not possible for me, and I avoided girls until I was 19. Even as early as 1981, Frank wrote in his diary, With such a dark soul. The world is full of vicious, cruel people. There should not be people like this in the world. I will punish these evil, vicious, cruel, scum people. Just before his 16th birthday, he wrote, I know one thing for certain. I am hated very much by many people. But they don't know anything of my hatred, which is twice as much as theirs. Everyone will pay for their sins. People think I'm worth nothing. I'll treat them as nothing. As Rambo said in First Blood, once you accept a problem, it's no longer there. A bullet in the right place seems to do the trick. Even though his past was very sad and he felt alone and had hatred for everyone, Frank received great grades, gaining him a place at the Melbourne University Law School. At over six feet tall, Frank was also a fierce tennis player who had frequent anger issues. Mrs. Margaret O'Leary, the past secretary at St. Raphael's Tennis Club, said that he often had on-court tantrums and did not easily accept losses. She said he had won single championship in his first year at the club, but left the next year after he lost the title. Sounds like a little bit of a whiner. Yeah. Although after the shooting, a neighborhood friend of the family, Nick Murphy, said that Frank Vitovic was intense and he loved his tennis and was passionate about it. Unfortunately, his success was cut short by an ongoing knee injury. He reportedly suffered a leg injury while jogging and that it was serious enough to warrant surgery, which failed to fix the problem. Leaving his leg partially lame, 
This apparently caused Frank to sink into a deep depression, which he was receiving counseling at Melbourne University on the day of the attack. He was getting madder at his friend Con, since he started teasing him about putting on weight and not being as fast as he used to be. Frank realized he was not a friend at all. After surgery, Frank returned to the university to continue his law studies and handed in a paper to his lecturer that was disturbing and full of abuse and murder. Frank went to two separate meetings 12 months previous to the incident that were pretty extensive and Frank spoke of suicide. He was sent to a psychologist and this psychologist wrote him up as being psychotic and in a bad way and suggested he go see a psychiatrist. Frank was a virgin and had possible mental illness. He had blamed his inability to get a girlfriend, celibacy, and being love shy on his shyness. Some say he had similarities to Elliot Roger. I've heard of Elliot Roger before. He is yeah? a character. Of course you have. I had not. For those like me who don't know who Elliot Rogers is, in 2014, he claimed to have suffered lack of attention from women as well as sexual frustration and was bullied in, and was bullied and mistreated from his peers for his shyness. He killed six people and injured 14 and then committed suicide in California. Yeah, the United this guy States of America. Yeah, this guy was a little whiner and his dad was very fa- kind of famous in the movie industry, so he thought he deserved a lot and never got it. And so, yeah, he decided to kill people instead. Oh, because his dad's famous, that means he can get any girl he wants? Well, that's what he was thinking, I, I believe, and that he was wor- he was like 20, early 20s, 22 or something like that, and never kissed a girl or anything like that. So he decided to get back at them. Maybe he should have made something of himself and become famous, and then he could have any girl he wanted. Oh, 100%. He just, he's yeah. one of those whiners who deserve yeah. everything, he, th- he thinks. Yeah, that's pretty much what I read up on him. He just seemed one of those people that thinks that, you know, the, um, the silver platter should be given to him full of woman. Oh, like Caesar. Yeah. So anyways, falling into a deeper depression, Frank started to plan his attack. He kept diaries throughout the years. Some of his entries show how his self-worth was diminished. He wrote, you are an alien amongst your own. It's hard for a self-conscious guy like me to talk to girls with confidence. I just like violent films. I don't know why. They make me feel better. All the violence gets me pumped up. The sound of the gun going pow. It's the only fun I know. Pow? Pow. Pew, pew. Pew. That's how girls do it. Pew, pew. I'm sure that there's some girls out there that can, you know, do the the big gun. Not me. Pew, pew. He also wrote... On December 5th, 1987, I'm geared up. I'm a steam train coming through and everyone better get out of the way. Death scares me, but not so much as other people. When I go out, people don't seem real. I don't feel part of it. I never have really. My life is such a failure. The world is against me. Two days before the massacre, on December 6th, Frank also wrote, I can see the path being laid out for me. I see those people in the city, and I admire them, and yet I hate them, because they've been the ones who've lumped shit on me all these years. They have all the things I want, but will never have. Those greedy businessmen and women in the city, they're all pigs, and pigs always end up in the slaughterhouse. Frank left a document at home, which was treated as a suicide note. It gave a glimpse into his motives. In the note, Frank mentioned he had experienced violent impulses, which ran through my whole body. He also spoke of being a failure to his family for being a dropout of school and apologized for it. He said, I should have listened to Pop and not played so much tennis instead of sticking to my law studies and things might have been different today. On the day of the massacre, Frank left a handwritten note like that of a little child addressed to his parents. A goodbye to his mum. To my dear mum, I love you with all my heart. When I think about how hard you worked for me and Lily and the love that you gave us, it always makes me cry. I've let you down very badly, mum, and I'm so sorry. You know how much anguish I felt over the knee injury. We all felt the same anguish. I knew I was never going to be successful, and it hurt me a lot. Things looked so bright for a few years, 
but it faded fast. I hope, Mom, you can remember me when I was a boy on your shoulders and you carried me to kindergarten. The note had not been read by his parents before it was discovered by the police. After, the parents were allowed to read it and try to help explain the contents, but even they could not help. Frank had obtained a shooter's license on September 17, 1987, and bought the gun a few weeks before the massacre. In order to afford it, he had to put on a layaway plan and collected it on October 21st, 1987. That's when you know you're broke when you're... <laughs> yeah, a, you broke put ass. On, you put a gun on layaway? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that actually kind of goes into that premeditated, right? Because he's been writing in his journal for such a long time or diary. And then he put this gun on layaway and he was still going for it. So it shows that nothing was going to change this course of action for him. No, it was not. He was going to do this no matter what. Yeah, exactly. It was just a matter of where and when. Yeah, well said. When he was asked why he wanted the gun, he remarked, I want to go hunting. He had illegally modified the 30 M1 carbine by reducing the barrel's length and loaded it with jacket bullets. The 30, probably 30 caliber, eh? Yeah, I would assume so. Yeah, I think it's a 30 caliber M1 carbine. And I'm not sure what jacketed bullets are, or jacketed ammunition. Jacketed? jacketed? Oh, that's ammunition? It's like full metal jacket. Full metal jacket pretty much reduces damage to the barrels, and it's for higher muzzle velocity. Okay. I don't know much about it. It's just FMJ. I know that from my video games, Call of Duty. <laughs> you always put FMJ on, it gets through the body armor. That's all I know. Video games. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm not a hunter. No, you're not. I'm a gamer. So getting back to the story, the diary also included apologies to the family and his planned actions and a suicide note. Among his comments to his sister Lily, he wrote, it's time for me to die. Life is not worth living. The final diary entry was written on the day of the shooting. Today, I must do it. There's no other way out. On December 8th, 1987, And Frank, guess what that time is. Is it movie trivia? It's movie music, time. Music trivia, okay. Movie time. Okay. Okay, so December 8th, 1987. A lot of good movies that year. Mm-hmm. At the time of this incident. Just going to throw this out there. At that time of my life, I actually didn't go to theaters because I just came from a little town, remember? Yep. But in the theaters. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll give you a hint. It was directed by Leonard Nimoy from Star Trek fame. Okay. Which I never knew till I looked into it. Is so it, the, Is it a Star Trek movie? No. Oh. It's the furthest thing from a Star Trek movie. Is it comedy? Yes. Oh, is it? Yes. So, the hint's going to be the the actors in the movie. Oh. So, there's three actors. Okay. So, one is Tom Selleck and his mustache. <laughs> his mustache must be introduced separately. Yes. And then there's Steve Gutenberg from Police Academy fame. Okay. And Ted Danson. Is it like Short Circuit or something? Or So, the plot is three... Men in oh, New York three, who are bachelors. Three men and a baby. Yes, it is. Yeah. I actually like that one. That was pretty big at the time. Yeah, it was. I remember watching it when I was uh, in the 80s. Yeah, I think I seen that in the early 90s. Because, like I said, I didn't go to the movies in the 80s. Yeah, it was a good movie. No, that's a lie. I did see E.T. in the movies, and that was, like, early 80s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good movie. So, yeah, that's the one. I didn't know it was directed by Letter Nimoy, though. No, neither did I. Yeah, that, that surprised me. When I looked into him, like, Letter Nimoy, I had to actually look at the his Wikipedia and make sure it was him, and it was. Wow. Yeah, so there's good that. info, yeah. Okay. So, let's get on to this day now. Yeah, let's get into murder now. Maybe we should have done this after. <laughs> What's done is done. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so, December 8th, 1987... Frank was dressed in military attire and carried a bag with a change of clothes, binoculars, a knife, and an illegal modified M1 carbine, and 200 to 300 rounds of ammo. It's a lot of ammo. After he left his home, he went to the university to see Mary Cook, who was a secretary that he had befriended. When she came to the counter, he didn't look like his usual self. He told her he was failing three classes 
and he had been deferred for a year. She asked if there was anything that she could do to help. He replied, he had a job to do at the post office. The head of the law of the university, Susie Nixon, told the Age newspaper that while Frank had once sought counseling during his career with the school, reports that he had been at the university on the day of the shooting were totally unfounded. He had not left his course with hostility, and Nixon believed that there was no direct link between the shooting and his deferral from the course. On December 8, 1987, at 4 p.m., Frank entered the 18-story building at 191 Queen Street and headed to the ninth floor. He was seen on security cameras to be there at 4.05 carrying a bag. At 4.16, Frank headed down to the credit union on the fifth floor, where he patiently waited in line for help. A lady came towards him and asked him how she could help him. He said he wanted to talk with Con Margellis, his former classmate and tennis partner who made fun of him. She proceeded to go back behind the counter to Con's office. Now at this time of day, there were about 800 to 1,000 people working in the entire building, which is astounding that only eight people were murdered that day. Con came out of his office and greeted Frank cheerfully. At that point, Frank pulled his weapon out from under his jacket, aiming it at Con and pulled the trigger, but luckily it jammed. Khan screamed, you've got to be kidding. Frank could be seen on the video chasing people around the office, preventing anyone from escaping. Since Khan had knowledge of the injuries that affected Frank's knee, Khan jumped over the counter and started running for safety with four or five other people towards the woman's washroom. As Khan was running, Frank shot at him again. But unfortunately, 19-year-old female office worker Judith Ann Morris got in the line of fire, and was killed. Judith was a Sunday school teacher for the past two years, and she and her fiancé were planning to marry in 1989. An eyewitness described what she had seen after the event. He was after Con, and Judith was in the way. She also said that his eyes looked completely insane, and his laugh was sick and not human, adding, he laughed after shooting Judith. A robbery alarm was activated by a staff member at 4.22 p.m., alerting the wormhole system, warning that something was happening. Joe Dixon, the counsel helping the court, said after the shooting on the fifth floor, telecom credit union security measures were adequate for all purposes except the visit of a maniac. Unable to find Khan, Frank decided on a new target. Frank took an elevator to the 12th floor. This floor is the Australia Post Security section. This is the place where they study postage stamps. Okay. Unfortunately, the routine practice on the 12th floor where staff had to open a security door to talk to visitors rendered its security measures ineffective. At first, people thought that they were hearing the backfiring of vehicles. Once it was happening on their floor as shots were so loud, They knew that it wasn't backfiring of cars. Now it was recognized as gunfire and that they knew they were in danger. On the 12th floor, as people were trying to hide, John Dyrek peeked through the small window on the door. He didn't see any reason not to open the door, so he did so. And that's when Frank raised his gun and shot John. At that moment, Frank heard Julie Faye McBean screamed and started towards her. That's when he realized he could only make one shot at a time, having to cock and re-cock the gun each time. He said out loud, They expect me to kill people with this gun? Since he had modified the gun, it now worked as a single shot instead of a semi-automatic. He then pointed his gun at a woman sitting at her desk and then panned over and aimed to the left and shot 20-year-old Julie Faye McBean of Glen Waverly two times. Julie was the eldest of three, a quiet young woman who studied accounting at night and was in line for promotion at the Australia Post, where she had only worked there for nine short months. Her mother, Irene McBean, got a visit by authorities at home later that day informing of her daughter's passing. 
a man in the corner office on that level, 29-year-old Warren David Spencer of Melt Menton? 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 Menton. Menton was also killed, but not before he pleaded, please no. Then Frank walked over to 18-year-old Annunziata Avignon, but everyone knew her as Nancy. She was laying down, hiding under a desk, pleading for her life, and Frank shot her twice from only three meters away, and then walked up to her and shot her in the head. That's extremely sad. Very much so. Two floors up, postal worker Sue Welfare was one of the survivors. David Spencer was her partner that Frank had just killed, leaving her alone to raise their two small children, Sarah and Dean Spencer. Meanwhile, people on the 11th story noticed there are nine police cars outside and were wondering what was going on. But within a minute, they heard gunshots. One employee, Glenn Schilling, was taking the elevator down from the 14th floor towards the ground level and heard shots being fired through the elevator walls. When he got to the ground level, he seen policemen hiding behind pillars and they told him to go back up. One of the people in the elevator pushed number 11, the one floor no one wants to be on at that moment. I wonder why the police sent them back up again. Well, at that point, the police didn't know who, you know, the guilty party was. They had phone calls from people saying that there were shots fired on different levels. So they weren't sure who were the shooters, who were the victims. But to my understanding, when somebody comes from an elevator down, you get them into safety and question them about what they heard and saw. Right. And then you figure out what's going on after that. You don't send them back up towards the gunfire. Seems a little weird to me. Yeah. Well, they did say that. Although the the cop was a good cop, um, it, but what he did was out of the ordinary for them. Extremely, I would never send anybody back up towards shooting when you're already at safety. I do have some information about that, which I'll go into later. Okay, sounds good. That might be a little bit more better to hear of what actually happened and why things happened this way. Yeah, it's it was wrong the way it happened, but it happened. It happened. Yeah, exactly. I guess not, we'll find out later why it happened. Yeah, not everyone's perfect. People make mistakes. But yeah, I'll, I'll explain a little bit later. Okay, sounds good. So anyways, Glenn Schilling went into one of the offices to look outside to see if anything was happening out of the ordinary. And that's when he seen all the police on the streets. And he said that was his oh shit moment. We've all had those oh shit moments. Frank went down the stairwell towards the 11th floor. Once there, Frank walked into the open space of the floor as it was a very large open space with the divider of a partition. You know, those offices with all the cubicles and stuff. That's the kind of area they were in. There was about 15 people working there in the finance and management section when Frank entered. In anticipation of the traffic jam, a few had already gone home early. The gunman was yelling out, screaming, Where are the police? Why don't they come? Frank was intent on being killed. For him, this was a suicide mission. 38-year-old Michael Francis McGuire, who was on the phone talking with his wife while standing at the coffee machine preparing for the work day to be ending, and to go home to his son's fifth birthday, told her that there was something going on. I don't know what it is. She told him, Well, don't be a hero. Scared, Michael ran towards a room that happened to be the same room that Glenn had entered. Frank opened the door, came in, and shot Michael once. Glenn took this moment to hide. He heard Michael pleading for his life, for Frank not to kill him. Glenn heard him take his last breaths, and then Frank held a gun about an inch from Michael's head and shot. Michael was silent. On his son's Fifth birthday, too, of all days? Yeah. There were other bullets that ripped through the partition wall, separating him and a group of office workers, ripping a chunk of plaster out of the wall that surrounded the elevator. Donald McElroy, who was in a corner, was next to be shot. The force threw his body towards a window and smashed it. Frank wasn't happy that he was still alive, as Donald was screaming in pain and said, You're giving me a lot of trouble, fat man. And shot 
Donald again. Moving to the northeast side of the floor, Frank's next victim was 38-year-old Marianne Jacoba Van Eyck from Box Hill and daughter of David and Joyce. She was shaking from being so scared. Frank told her that he would put her out of her misery and shot her in the head. 28-year-old Catherine Mary Dowling was next to be fatally shot. Frank then shot Rosemary Spiteri in the neck. She was still alive. Then Frank came into the room where his old schoolmate, Frank Carmody, was hiding behind a desk. This day started out just like any other day for Frank Carmody. He kissed his wife and children goodbye, and he left with words, I'll see you tonight, before heading to the office where he had worked for the past 18 years. Unfortunately, that was not to be the case. Frank Carmody was staring at Frank as he came into the room. It was so quiet, you could hear the ticking of the clock. Frank said, Why doesn't anyone love me? Frank Carmody had many thoughts go through his mind, knowing Frank was going to shoot him. As a Christian, you immediately lock into God. You hear some of the others praying. You ask him for help. What do I do here, Lord? You are asking him for direction. Frank said silly thoughts mingled with prayer. I was thinking about the party I was going to that night. I was thinking to myself, I'm going to miss it. Bizarre. But that's what happened. So he's just coming at us. I'm trying not to think what to do and ask the Lord to show me. He came up to a woman crouching behind another desk and turned towards her and bang, bang. Frank mentioned the gun is jamming. So Frank Camardi took the opportunity to do something. He lunged at Frank without a thought. Frank Camardi said he isn't a hero. It was survival. That's what it was. Survival. I'm sure that there's many people in the world that would consider him a hero. I know I do. At that point, Frank Amati wasn't strong enough and Frank was able to fend off his attacker. Frank Amati was now lying on the ground. He said, I saw the barrel facing me and I ducked down quickly and he shot me through the back. The bullet went through me. I felt it go through me. It didn't hurt. It was like a burning sensation. Frank Amati also had a head wound and a couple shoulder wounds. He shot at us a lot, and he got me five times. Most of the bullet wounds were flesh wounds, apart from the one in his back. Frank then walked over to 32-year-old Rodney Gerald Brown and shot him. Rodney was still alive when the police arrived on the scene, but later died. The doctor, who had performed several autopsies, told the inquest that even if Brown had been taken to a neurological unit within 15 minutes of being shot, his chances for survival would have been very slight. Tony Joya, who was hiding, seen his co-worker Rodney get killed at point blank and seen that Frank was now aiming the gun back on Frank Camardi. He quickly thought he should jump on Frank as he was facing the other way and knowing he would be next to be shot. He thought, I die or I can do this. It is my only chance. Without another thought, Tony lunged onto Frank, and then Donald helped. Do you remember Donald? Uh, was he the guy that he called fat? Yes, it is. Okay, yeah, I do. Yeah, I remember him. Okay. Well, he's still alive. The two men were able to wrestle the rifle away from him. Frank Camardi said, I saw his face. It was not human. He was a person possessed by a demon. Rosemary, who was shot in the neck earlier, took the rifle and hid it in the refrigerator. Frank had gone crazed. He knew that he had been captured, and since he had all intentions of shooting himself, he struggled towards the broken window without saying a word. His face, head, and stomach were all cut up as he managed to crawl through the broken glass. Frank was completely out dangling by his ankles which Joya still had in his grasp. So that Joya didn't fall to his death as well, he felt someone holding on to him. Frank eventually got Joya to let go, 
after fighting for over a minute. Others came to help Joya, but Frank finally kicked and broke free of Joya's grasp. Detective Colin McLaren saw splinters of broken glass falling like snow on the street. Then Frank hit the ground in front of him. With such force, his lifeless body bounced a meter from the ground or the height of a car. Colin had to take a step backwards or else he would have been hit as well. On that warm day in 1987, at 4.34 and 34 seconds, Frank Vidovic died on impact from plunging 11 stories or 130 feet of the Australian Post building on Queen Street. Detective McLaren watched him die after hearing shots being fired for about 17 minutes. Even though he could only use his gun as a single shot, he still managed to shoot off around 40 bullets. That's pretty good considering he had, what, two to three hundred? As the killer lay dead on the sidewalk, Detective McLaren, seeing a magazine round full of bullets, rolled out from his jacket pocket. At first, the police were unsure if the person on the ground was a victim or the perpetrator. But thankfully, Detective McLaren figured it out quick enough after seeing the magazine. A pathologist said in the inquest that he found no legal or illegal drugs and alcohol in Frank's system. He also said that Frank was killed instantly from multiple injuries consistent in falling from a great height. On November 25, 1988, Joya and Kamadi were later awarded Australia's second highest bravery decoration, the Star of Courage, for tackling the perpetrator and ending the massacre. Some reports claimed that the employee pushed Frank to his death. However, the counselor assisting the coroner, Julian Leckie, concluded that it was an honest mistake as the details were not accurate. At 4.30 p.m., police and members of the Special Operations Group searched the building for accomplices, and at 5 p.m., the Special Operations Group confirmed that the dead man on the street was the gunman. The all-clear was given for ambulance officers to enter the building and attend the injured. As word got out about the incident, the building was getting overrun by friends and family. The police had to restrain them from entering. Victorian Police Minister Race Matthews and General Jim Kennan also witnessed the event from the building opposite while gathering for a meeting. Detective McLaren was the first police officer that was there that afternoon. And as he ran into the building in the Melbourne's CBD to look for survivors, when he went into the elevator, it opened up and what he seen was a horde of people that came out screaming of bodies covered in blood and crazed looks on their faces. Detective McLaren said, There were bodies everywhere. Many people were dead and the rest injured. Some were hysterical, screaming or cowering under their desks or clutching at each other in the corner of the office. None of them could talk. They were hysterical. Frank Camotti had collapsed on the floor. His breathing was getting harder. There was blood dripping everywhere. It was dripping down his face. He knew he was hit in the back, too. He could hear helicopters hovering outside, but knew he didn't have much time left. An ambulance worker came and placed a hand on Kamadi's shoulder and said, You will be all right, mate. You will be okay. Helping him, he cut his tie off. Kamadi remembers them doing that, thinking, That's my best tie. It's Christian Dior. Christian Dior? I have no idea because I've never worn a tie. I've worn a tie once in my life, and I tell you what, it was not that. Yeah. It was probably a thrift store one, probably tell you the truth. Oh, man. It was for my graduation. <laughs> oh, was it? Yeah. I'm sure your mom got you something nice. Yeah, it's probably something. If it wasn't like that, I bet you. Well, no. it's a That's an expensive tie. Yeah, it was that wasn't what I was wearing. Yeah, but you don't like anything expensive. No. When Detective McLaren got to the 11th floor, people told him to go to the window because that's where he is. At that moment... Detective McLaren knew it was only one perpetrator. Next, he was told where he could find the gun. The fridge. A search of Vitovic's room, without a search warrant, but permission from his parents, revealed that Frank kept press clippings of the Clifton Hill Massacre with extracts underlined in red 
Police believed he had always intended to shoot people in the Queen Street building. What was the Clifton Hill massacre? What I got from that was um, Julian Knight had killed seven people and injured 19 just four months earlier. Okay, yeah, I've never heard of that one. Good case, uh, probably for the future, maybe. It might be already done, though. Yeah, probably. Take a look into it someday. Yeah, for sure. During their investigation, the authorities also found an unread note that Frank wrote to his parents in all his diary entries, which we've already talked about. The contents of the diary were also read in the inquest on the 12th day of the hearing. In his later discovered manifesto, addressed to Sally, because he said that he always wanted a girlfriend named Sally, Frank Vidovic said, The whole world hates me, but don't worry, world. I hate you back. Three times as fucking much. They found so much evidence, they were tossing it out the windows to be loaded up. Officers overheard the parents talking about calling their lawyer and asking them about getting a warrant. But before the officers were asked to leave, they had already bagged up as many of the items as they could, as well as the well-documented diary, and tossed it out of the window in two separate bags and retrieved them later. The police, however, did fess up to the coroner about stealing the items. He was upset, but the coroner said it was vital information to the investigation. The information they found might be important for future events as well. In the September 1988 hearing, courts heard that there was chaos during and immediately after the shooting. There was confusion over which of the police officers present was in charge of everything. At the hearing on October 4th, 1988, according to Inspector Adrian Fife, said the traffic police officer in charge at the scene, Detective Colin McLaren, had acted appropriately, and even Joe Dixon, counsel assisting the court, said the policeman's response was satisfactory and no complaints could be made about it. So what you're saying is he did his job properly. He did do his job properly. Well done. The only thing that I have a complaint so far, which I haven't heard about yet, was when they set the police people back up in the elevator. <laughs> so hopefully we get into that <laughs> really know. quick here. That was so bad. I wonder who did that as well. <laughs> oh. Did they ever find the person that sent them up? They know, but they're not coming forward with that information to the public. Yeah, it just probably creates a bad name for them. Exactly. All right, sounds good. Fife also said... The radio call sign he used, which Detective McLaren used, had identified him as the officer in charge. He said the police response was fast and the decision not to send ambulance officers into the building until it was clear was the right decision, noting that no one died because of any delay. Joe Dixon conceded that the senior constable, this is where we're going to get to him. Oh, the, oh yeah, here we go. Yeah. Okay. So Joe Dixon conceded that the senior constable who sent people back into the building might not have taken the best course of action. And although three of the people who were sent back into the building had emotional trauma, not one person who was sent back died or was injured. One of those people was Glenn Schilling, who needed therapy after the ordeal. Yeah, so if I get this right, they supported his decision even though it probably wasn't the best decision or because nobody got hurt but i bet you if somebody got hurt the whole thing oh. would have been different than the outcome that was there it's a fair point thank you actually i never thought about that until just now good job babe <laughs> police on the floor had also called out and pointed the guns in the direction of the elevator because they were unaware if frank was working alone or had an accomplice since there were calls about shootings on the 5th, 12th, and 11th floor. The psychologist in charge of the team, Mark Creamer, counseled workers and their families and said the video of Frank firing his gun on the 5th floor should not be made public as it would cause significant distress to those being counseled. The psychologist even advised against publishing a still image of Frank that was taken from the video. And the news media organizations said those images would be made public at the end of the inquest because the coroner, Hal Hallenstein, refused to suppress the publications of the photographs taken from the fifth floor security video that showed Frank. 
forensic psychologist Dr. Alan Bartholomew told the coroner's court that Frank would have been eligible at the time to be certified insane under the Mental Health Act. After studying Frank's diaries, Bartholomew concluded he was a paranoid schizophrenic and that there was no doubt the personality test worsened his depression and might have contributed to the decline in his mental state. Bartholomew agreed that Vitovic was criminally insane at the time of the shooting. Yeah, he definitely wasn't in a good mental state. No. Take a gun, shoot people. No. Of course they're not sane. Since this event, the gun laws have changed in Australia. They banned all rapid-fire long guns, including those already owned. Also, now there's a 28-day waiting period imposed, and owners are required to keep guns and ammunition separately. 34 years has passed, and surviving such a traumatic happening changes one's life. Priorities in life change. Importance is placed more on family and trust in God. Kamadi was later diagnosed with multiple myeloma. He had chemotherapy and a stem cell transplant a year later. He said this has brought about a heightened emotional awareness. Frank Kamadi warns about damage bullying can do and talks to school children about the massacre. He said it's important they be aware of what their words and actions can do to other people. A stained glass window was later constructed as a memorial to the victims. A plaque accompanying the window bears the inscription, The window above is a loving memory of eight Australia Post and Telecom credit union friends and colleagues who were killed at their workplace in Queen Street on 8 December 1987. This building is now a hotel called the Medina Hotel. So that's almost going to conclude the case of the Queen Street Massacre. And Frank Vidovic is not here with us anymore. Thank God. Yep. So I want to touch on the people that lost their lives that day because they are the people that are now gone from here because this one guy was bullied in high school. Yeah. So we're just going to go out and read their names instead of going through the trial and stuff like that. So I want to start with Judith Ann Morris, 19. Julie Faye McBean, 20. Anun Zieta Avion, 18. Warren David Spencer, 29. Michael Francis McGuire, 38. Marianne Jacoba Van Eyck, 38. Catherine Mary Dowling, 28. And Rodney Gerald Brown, 32. Yeah, these people lost their lives and we just wanted to acknowledge them over the, the guy that ended their lives. Yeah, Frank Vitovic. Yep. But anyway, that's the case of the Queen Street Massacre. Mm-hmm. And we went to Australia. We did. We went down under. So I hope everyone liked this case because I've never really heard of this one before. So I hope uh, it reaches out to everybody. I really enjoyed researching this one. Strange to say, but yeah, this one was, uh, it got me right in the heart. Like, I had to stop numerous times. Okay, so now that that case is done, what would you put this on the heinous scale? Can I do a 0.5? Yeah, if you want. Okay, so I'd give it an 8.5. Yeah, that sounds about right. I'd probably go around there too. I mean, it's a pretty brutal case, like point blank range shooting to the mm -hmm. head. And there's, you know, numerous victims here and they're just going to work. So I'd probably put it pretty high. And it was so planned out. Like he's been planning this for since childhood. Yeah. About killing people. Exactly. And I mean, you know what? It could have been a whole lot worse if he had, because he had 300 rounds there. Yeah. If he never modified that gun, he could have killed off hundreds of people. Yeah. There was a thousand people in that building. So, yep. I mean, this could have been a lot worse than it That's actually right. was. That's right. Okay. So, if anybody wants to say what they have on the Hannah scale, let us know. Or any ideas for future episodes. Yeah, exactly. You can reach us at worldstruecrime at hotmail.com. We have Instagram. We have Facebook at World's True Crime. Yeah, and we can go to our website as well, worldstruecrime.com. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's the case of Frank Vitovic. And so next week, we're going to go to India. Mm. And there's a case I've never heard of there, but I want to go deeper into it. You know what I just thought of? doing. We're doing India one week. We should have like Indian food. 
you know, like having, like making food of the, the nationality. Yeah, that's an idea. I think that'd be kind of cool. That would be. So as we say every episode, I'm Brad. I'm Denise. And the world is not always as it seems. No, it's not. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.